we, we introduced the concept very quickly last week at the end of the lecture. Let's go back. And just the motivation for what leads to the, to the internet protocol, IP, and what is internet working. Although we didn't go through the, the many example technologies, we know that we can distinguish between LANs and wide area networks covering different uh, geographical areas, uh, having different technologies. So you can think, if you think of any home, an organization, some company, government organization, they have their own internal network to connect their computers inside their buildings, inside their uh, offices and so on. So usually LANs, local area networks. But also they want to connect together, usually using uh, either larger LANs or wide area networks. And we'd like to allow, well, not like to allow people, the different organizations will choose the best technology to support their requirements. So for example, in SIT, we have, inside our LAN, we have wired Ethernet especially to the, the PCs in the lecture rooms, in the labs, in the offices. And we also have wireless LAN for students and also for, for staff and faculty. So we have two different LAN technologies. Some other organization may use a different technology. We go across the road to one of the factories. Maybe that factory has been there for a long time and they have an old LAN technology, a token ring network. Or maybe they have some new upgraded uh, fiber-based LAN technology. Okay? Depending upon their requirements, they'll choose the technology that, that best suits them. Similar when we connect the LANs across a, a wide network. Many different technologies to choose from. Uh, telephone network-based, optical fiber, satellite, uh, different wireless systems for wide area networks. What we would like is to allow to connect multiple LANs and wide area networks together and allow any computer on any of those networks to communicate with any other computer, irrespective of what technology the individual networks are using. So this is the concept of internetworking, connecting those different networks together. And we achieve that using datagram packet switching in the internet, or packet switching generally, where we have, for example, this case, multiple LANs and wide area networks, and we connect them together using packet switches. So these are packet switches here. But more specifically, when we talk about the internet, we refer to them as routers. It's just a, diff a different name. Routers are packet switches that operate at the network layer. So we're in the middle layer of our five layer stack, the network layer. So they play a major part in connecting these component of these uh, smaller networks together to form one large network. So we have these smaller networks using different technologies potentially. We connect them together using routers. And when we connect them together, if we're using uh, the, some internet working protocol, which we'll see shortly, then we'll allow anyone on any of these networks to communicate with anyone else, and we'll get as a result this one large network called an internetwork, or an internet. Okay, so the terminolo terminology is listed here. Uh, we'll talk about routers that connect these smaller networks together. And because when we take the smaller networks and connect them together to get one large network, often we'll say that the smaller networks are subnetworks. They are subnetworks of the larger network. Subnetworks or subnets. So in this example there are nine subnets. And we join those nine subnets together using the set of routers and the result is one large network called an internetwork or an internet. So this is an example internet. So an internet is a network we get when we join these subnets together using routing or routers in a simple 
just definition. And the process of doing that is called internetworking. So a general internet, that is any network that we connect together in this way, we can call an internet. But we know that in, across the world many networks are all connected to the one large network. And that one large network we refer to as the internet. Usually the, with the uppercase I for internet. That's the, the network that we use on a, on, a, on a daily basis to form the internet. And the internet use, uses, as we'll see in this topic, the internet protocol, a specific protocol that will allow any computer on any of the subnets to communicate with any other, uh, with computers on any other subnet. So it's just some terminology that we talk about. Routers connect subnets, subnets join together to form an internet. We distinguish between routing and forwarding, and I've said this before in, in previous topics. We say that routing is the process of discovering the best path through the network. Forwarding is the process of once we have a path, sending the data across that path. We forward the data via switch uh, through the network. And some, some other terminology to, to make things a bit clearer as we go forward. We've already talked about packet switching and circuit switching, so these devices that connect networks together we can talk about as switches. Now we're talking about using packet switching we'll see specifically the internet uses datagram packet switching. So these are datagram packet switches, but we'll generally just call them a router. That's the more common name in the internet. What's inside one of these clouds? Okay, so I've drawn a cloud to represent a, a small net or some network, a LAN for example. What's inside it? Uh, I'll not try and draw it, but okay. you can think this cloud has different end-user end devices attached, PCs, laptops, whatever the user is using, servers even. Inside the cloud is depends upon the, the technology used in that subnet. For example, if it's a wired LAN, we may have some PCs connected via cables into some central Ethernet switch and that Ethernet switch connected into this router. So we introduced very briefly last week a common topology in a wired LAN is we take our PCs, they have a, a cable that, and they all go into one central switch called an Ethernet switch. And then that one central switch can then go to the router. What about a wireless LAN? If this LAN 4 was a wired LAN, LAN 1 was a wireless LAN, well, in addition to a switch, we may also have things like access points, where we have laptops, mobile phones, connect wirelessly to some one or more access points, and then the access points have wired network into some switch, and then possibly into a router. So, depending upon the technology used in here, what's inside the cloud uh, may differ. The idea of drawing a cloud is we don't care, from this perspective, we don't care what is in here, we just say it's some uh, network technology. It could be a, a satellite link across the globe. So across the wide area network 3, it may be connecting up to a, a, a satellite up in space and then down to one of these other routers. So we hide that detail of in here. So, coming back to switches, it gets confusing because now we have different types of switches. We will talk about packet switches, specifically at the network layer, now that we're in the, the network layer, a packet switch we'll refer to as a router. If we're in another network, we may use circuit switches. Inside wired LANs, we often refer to Ethernet switches. 
land switches, different types of devices. So if we connect these subnets together via routers, how do we get data from one computer to some other computer? Well, we use an internetworking protocol. Because the different subnets use different technologies, we need some other protocol to overcome those differences. Differences in addressing, differences in the way to recover from errors, differences in how to transfer the data efficiently across uh, the network. So we introduce a new protocol, an internetworking protocol, which has the aim of getting the data from one computer across this internet to the destination. What would such an internetworking protocol do? What's some requirements? Some are listed here. Provide links between subnetworks, between subnets. So be able to join different subnets together. And we use routers for that. To be able to provide some form of routing to find the path and forwarding or delivering the data across the different subnets. So to make sure we can get data from source to destination. So we, we know one way to do that, datagram packet switching. And we know concepts for how to do routing in the network. So we can use the concepts of datagram packet switching and the, the concepts of routing that we saw in the previous topic to, to solve this, this problem. Usually when we build a network, we use it to transfer data, but we'd like to make sure that that network is operating correctly. We don't just build it and leave it run for 10 years. We need to up, get updates on how it's running, if there are any problems in the network, and to perform maintenance on that network. So it may be useful if we have a protocol that allows us to send data through the an internet to also to be able to collect data about the current status, to monitor, to report if there are errors, some, some form of monitoring. Importantly, an internetworking protocol needs to deal with the many differences between the subnets. On this subnet, we may have uh, one particular addressing scheme for the hardware addresses, like the Ethernet 48-bit hardware addresses here. On this wide area network number three, we may have a different addressing scheme. So when we want to communicate between two computers on different networks which use a different addressing schemes, well, it's very hard to communicate because my computer on LAN 4 doesn't know about the addresses used on other networks, which may be on the other side of the world. So an internet working protocol has to deal with that somehow. And the normal way is to introduce a, a new addressing scheme a new addressing scheme that all devices on the network use. We'll see in the internet protocol that's IP addresses. Uh, another difference or a problem that's, that occurs when we have multiple subnets is the concept of error recovery. Let's say, so error recovery is how to cope with errors across our links, across our subnets. For example, we know of using uh, retransmissions, ARQ schemes, stop and wait, go back end, selective reject, to send our data, wait for an ACK, send it again. That's a way to recover for errors. But different technologies may use different error recovery mechanisms. So this LAN 4 may be using some stop and wait, ARQ. This wide area network using some selective reject. Maybe this wide area network doesn't have any error recovery. It's a very simple uh, protocol inside here. We don't know, we cannot predict in all the networks in the world what technology they'll use for error recovery. So now, if I want to send data via these subnets, 
I want to make sure when I send it, it gets delivered to the destination. Well, I'm confident that it'll get delivered across the first subnet because that has a means for recovering from errors. So is the second subnet. But the third one does not because it has no inbuilt uh, error recovery mechanism, as an example. So if I send data across this path, I know I have no guarantees that it's going to get delivered to the destination. So one thing that we may want an internetworking protocol to do is to provide error recovery across the entire network, across the path, as opposed to just across a single subnet or across a link. So there are many differences between the technologies we may use in the subnets and we must deal with those differences and that's what an internet working protocol should, should try to overcome. For example, differences in security, uh, ways to report errors inside the subnets, different protocol parameters like what is the maximum packet size. One subnet may have a maximum size of 1,500 bytes. The next technology has a maximum size of 10,000 bytes. So when we send data across the network, what size data should we send? 1,500 or 10,000? Well, we need to con consider the maximum sizes supported by all the subnets along the path. So an internet working protocol will try and deal with these issues. So that's some general requirements for an internet working protocol. And people over the years have developed several or different internet working protocols, different protocols to try and meet these requirements. One of them is called the Internet Protocol, IP. And there are others. The Internet Protocol has become the most widely used one. The others uh, old ones which uh, were really replaced by IP, only used in very old networks, or some which are used in very specific domains, very uh, small or, or very specialised networks. But the main internet working protocol available is the internet protocol. It turns out that the internet protocol is does not meet all of these requirements that we want. The idea of the designers of, the, of IP were to in fact keep IP very simple. So it does some of these things, but for those that it doesn't do, it leaves to other protocols. So it's an idea of keep this internet protocol simple by just providing a few features. Those other extra features that we may want to provide use other protocols like ICMP, TCP and others we may see over this course. Let's look at IP and, and see what, what features it does provide. <coughs> so this topic we're going to look at what is the internet protocol, how does it work, and then we'll look at parts of um, well, what are IP addresses? How are they structured? What do they mean? And we'll get a bit of a, an example of an IP address today as well. So IP is, is the internet working protocol used in the internet and the main one used in the world today. There are in fact two main versions of IP. IP version 4 and IP version 6. IP version 5, they skipped that because there was some other obscure protocol used that referred to IP version 5. So really today we have IPv4 and IPv6. It turns out uh, IP version 4 has been around for many years. So uh, I think in the 1970s it was first specified, so what's 30 or 40 years. IP version 6 has been around for more than 10 years. Uh, maybe designed 20 years ago almost. It turns out today, although both exist, 
IP version 4 is still the main one used in the internet. IPv6 is available and most devices, many devices uh, support IPv6 but not many networks use it. Uh, so my, my laptop or, or most standard operating systems support both version 4 and version 6 but for example the SIT network, the routers inside SIT and in, inside Tamasat do not support or do not use IPv6. So we're going to focus this course on IP version 4 in maybe next semester in if you take computer networks and network architectures I think it's called ITS 327 IPv6 will be covered. And there are others mainly old ones IPX, X25 and others but we're focusing just on IPv4 the, the main one it is. Developed by the US Department of Defense but now it's maintained, the standard is maintained by the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. They, they look after it and they develop IPv6 and any enhancements. What does it do? It operates at the network layer. So in our five layer stack, the network layer is the one in the middle. It's an inter-networking protocol. It uses datagram packet switching. So of those three switching techniques, we're using datagram packet switching, the simplest of them all. The ones where we just take our data, break it into packets and send them. And it's connectionless, which means there's no concept of establishing a connection before you send data, which is what we know with datagram packet switching. We'll see in some protocols what we do is, if I want to send data from source to destination, the source first contacts the destination saying, I want to send data to you, and the source and destination may negotiate some parameters for this upcoming data transfer. The destination may get prepared to receive the data, for example, allocate buffer space, uh, so they may choose parameters for the protocols to use. So they set up a connection. That's a connection-oriented protocol that does that. They establish a connection. IP does not do that. We say IP is connectionless. There is no concept of a connection. It's very simple. There's no overhead of establishing a connection, but it means that we cannot inform the destination that we're about to send data. We'll see the, a main example of a connection-oriented protocol, one that does create a connection, we'll see that in the next topic is TCP. So what features of IP? It provides data delivery. Okay, That's our main, main goal, to get data from source to destination. It provides addressing. So we're going to see that because the different subnets use their own addressing scheme, the internet protocol introduces a new addressing scheme, IP addresses, such that the, the devices on the internet all use this same common addressing scheme. So it defines the format of those addresses and the meaning. And another feature of fragmentation and reassembly, which means it's got the ability, if we have a big packet, to fragment it into smaller packets, smaller chunks, and send them as smaller chunks, and then reassemble them at some destination. So that's sometimes needed uh, when we send data which is too large to support, uh, to be supported by a subnet. We're going to spend a lot of time in this topic on addressing. We'll see the basic mechanism for data delivery. Uh, there's a few slides on fragmentation and reassembly. We may just mention that quickly. One thing, sorry, what does it not do? So one way to understand what IP is, is to look at well some of those features on the previous slide that we'd like that are not provided by IP. It doesn't establish a connection, we said it's connectionless. Which means 
before we send data, there's no negotiation of how to send the data. We just send it. So the destination doesn't know data's coming, it just starts receiving the data. There's no error control in IP. My source computer sends the IP packets, we'll actually call them IP datagrams, and if they don't get to the destination, too bad. The source will not retransmit. There are no acts coming back. So I just send the packets, and if they get there, good, data is delivered. If they don't get there, because of some errors in the network, from IP's perspective, it doesn't care. And I think you know that that's not so good for some applications. It doesn't do any flow control, so it doesn't provide flow control, so if my computer at one endpoint is sending very fast and the receiver destination is very slow, we may overflow that receiver. IP doesn't care. But we know that in some cases we'll need to deal with those issues. What if there are errors? IP doesn't fix them. In the internet, we generally leave those features to another protocol called TCP. That's at the next layer up, the transport layer. IP does not report the status of any links of any uh, devices in the network. That's a nice feature we'd like to have, to know whether the network is working. IP doesn't do that. There's another protocol called ICMP that will do it for us. In, in most cases, IP doesn't provide any priority for data or any quality of service. What that means is when we send an IP packet, send it through the internet, I send my IP packet, which is for my web browsing, you send yours through the internet, you, which is for some voice call, IP doesn't treat them any differently. It treats them the same. It doesn't give one priority over another. That's a nice feature to have in some cases. Sometimes it would be good for my voice packets, that, that, the packets that belong to my voice over the internet call, to get a higher priority than someone's web browsing packets. Because often with voice we want a small delay so we can talk and communicate efficiently. IP does not have such features to provide any priority priority or quality of service. It's left to some add-on features called diffserve and insert, which we will not cover. It doesn't have any inbuilt security. I send an IP packet from some source computer. It goes through these subnets and gets to the destination. Anyone with access to these intermediate devices, these routers, or these subnets, can potentially see the contents of the data that I'm sending across the internet. There's no encryption of that data, so that uh, the data, we say, is sent in the clear. Again, there are applications that we would like to make that data secure so that someone with access to these intermediate subnets still cannot see what I'm sending. IP doesn't do that. There's another feature, or another add-on, really, called IPsec that adds that security. We will see TCP in a bit more depth in the next topic. You'll see ICMP in some practical tasks. The others we were not. In terms of our five layer stack, it's in the middle, the network layer. The simple view is that all the subnet technologies, the LANs, the wide area networks, like wireless LAN, Ethernet, uh, some of the w wide area technologies, frame relay, ATM, optical fiber technologies, satellite, microwave, wireless, think of them at the physical and data link layer. They are used within the individual subnets. The internet protocol in the middle of our stack, we think joins them all together. It's the common thing amongst all the computers in the internet. And above that we have transport and application layer. 
So what we're going to see is that all of the computers which generally want internet access need to support the internet protocol. Your mobile phone, laptop, PC, and also the routers that connect the subnets together all must support IP. It's the one common thing for the devices that connect to the internet. If they don't in implement IP, then generally they cannot get access to the internet unless they go via some intermediate device, some special device. So you may use different physical and data link layers. You may use different transport protocols. There are some common, very common ones, but there are many others as well. Many different application protocols, but for internet access, you need to use IP. So as some people say, the core of the internet is built around IP. We will see that IP doesn't provide or doesn't specify which routing protocols to use. You can choose the routing protocol. A routing protocol is a protocol that automatically finds the routes through the network, the best paths, and creates our routing tables. IP doesn't do that. It leaves it to some other routing protocol. We'll, we'll see a little bit about ICMP and ARP uh, later. Who has done the practice lesson on packets? Hands up. Practice lesson on packets. Is that a hand? No. Two? Any more? Try and do the practice lesson on packets. Okay, it, It's not related to any specific topic. It's about what do we mean by what's a packet? What's the structure of a packet? Common examples. In fact, one of the examples is that I use in that lesson is IP datagram. So uh, some people have already seen this and they'll understand this straight away. Others, uh, a little bit more time. But still, try and do that lesson because it's useful understanding how most protocols uh, uh, structure their packets in the internet today. So the internet protocol, like most protocols, has some packet structure. It contains data and a header. There's no trailer at the end, just the header at the front and then data. What's that structure? Specifically, what does the header look like? What information does it contain? Here's a picture of an IP packet. In fact, we often call it an IP datagram. Okay, so sometimes you'll hear me say IP packet. Other times, IP datagram. They're the same thing. The typical IP datagram contains a 20-byte header followed by data. The way this diagram is drawn is that our 20-byte header, the packet is just a sequence of bits, and the header is a sequence of bits where sets of bits have some specific meaning. We'll see that the first four bits in the header mean or indicate the version of IP we're using, either 4 or 6. So the first four bits indicate the version of the protocol. So in a packet, it's just a long sequence of bits, but to draw it on a piece of paper on the screen, instead of drawing the, the large continuous sequence of bits, we commonly structure it in some way. In this case, we've structured it so that this each row indicates a sequence of 32 bits. And we read row by row. So this is the first bit, or on this diagram, the zero bit, if we start counting at zero. The 31st bit, and then we come back to here, the 32nd bit, and, and so on. So we read row by row. It's just a way to present the structure of that packet in some convenient small uh, picture. So let's look at the fields of the header. What information is contained in every IP datagram, in the header of each datagram? The version, a value that indicates either version 4 or version 6. We're dealing just with version 4. The header length is normally, or by default, 20 bytes. 
but it turns out you can add some optional fields. Okay, so you, if you, there are some optional extra features of IP that allow you to add extra fields. That's this options part. And that may vary in size. Therefore, there's a field H length which indicates the length of the header. It counts in, I think, four groups of four bytes. So, in fact, by default, the value is five because there are one, two, three, four, five rows or five groups of four bytes, 20 bytes in total. But if you add some options, this will increase. So, it just is a way so that when we receive this datagram, we know how big is the header so that we know, well, where does the header finish and where does the data start? Because if I receive a sequence of bits, I need to know well, which parts of the header and which parts of the data. So the header length indicates that. Diff serve and ECN, they are fields in the packet that I use to provide priority and some um, performance enhancements in the internet. I said that IP doesn't provide any priority. Well, it doesn't. The protocol doesn't, although the header field the header has fields available to indicating the priority of the packet. By default, IP doesn't treat them any different. We're not going to touch upon these two fields. Okay. You need to go into advanced parts of internet working to see them in use. Total length is a 16-bit value that indicates the total size of our datagram. Header plus data. Maximum size 65,656 bytes with a 16-bit value. That's the maximum size of our datagram. Uh, in practice, it's usually much smaller. Okay. But that's what we can go up to. So if we know the header length and we know the total length, then we can calculate the data length. ID identification is like a sequence number. I send the first datagram, value 1. Next one, value 2. So we can include a, some sequence number in the datagrams. But we don't have any retransmission schemes. So we don't use it for any error recovery, but we can use it to keep track of uh, packets as, as we're sending the, or, the ordering of them. Uh, the next two parts, flags and fragment offset. What we may do is send a large datagram, let's say 10,000 bytes, send it. It gets to a subnet which has a maximum size of 1,000 bytes. So we've got a 10,000 byte datagram, but the network technology only supports sending frames of 1,000 bytes. So we'll need to fragment that 10,000 byte datagram into smaller chunks. So that's the process of fragmentation where we break the data into smaller chunks and send them as, say, 10 different IP datagrams, 10 fragments. If we do that, we use the flags and the fragment offset to keep track of that we've performed the fragmentation and that we... Uh, the ordering of those fragments. So if we break our original datagram into 10 fragments, then we keep track of fragment 1, fragment 2, and, and so on. Because at the receiver, when we receive those 10 fragments, we need to reassemble them and get the original large 10,000 byte datagram back. I think in this course we're not going to go into much detail of how fragmentation and reassembly works. Uh, but we use these fields to support it. What's time to live? Where do we use time to live, or where have we seen a concept similar to time to live? It's the number of. So you, you may have seen it when you uh, send some data across the internet or test the network. You can see some information about the number of hops that we traverse or the number of routers that we traverse from source to destination. Uh, remember flooding. In flooding, one of the extensions was a hop limit. 
the idea was that the source sets the hop limit to say three. We send it to the across the first link, the first hop. It's reduced to two. The next one, it's down to one. The next one, it's down to zero. And then it's no longer sent. We used a hop limit to limit how many hops that packet would traverse when we did flooding. The same concept of time to live. The source sets some time to live value. Although it says time to live, it doesn't measure real time, it usually measures hops. So if I set the time to live in my IP datagram at the source to be 3, when it's sent across the first hop to the first router, it's reduced to 2, then sent across the next hop, reduced to 1, then the next hop down to 0. Once it reaches 0, that router will not send it again. It's reached, it, it's expired, that packet has died. So it's used in a similar way to a hop limit and it's used in to diagnose parts of the network operation you may see to see how many hops your packet traverses. Uh, one thing that it's, it's useful for is, is if you send a packet in the network and there's some misconfiguration in the network. Maybe there's a route such that one router sends the packet to the next router and then that one sends it back to the first router because of some error in the network. And they keep sending to each other. Okay? And it go, becomes a loop. that the, the packets go back and forth or enter some loop in the network. Or they go forever. That packet would be sent forever in, in that network, in that loop. Setting a time to live means that eventually the time to live will get down to zero and the packet will be destroyed. It will not be kept being sent. So it's a way to stop uh, such errors for um, causing packets to be sent forever. And we use it for diagnost diagnostic purposes. So the source sets the value and it's reduced for every hop we transmit this datagram across. Similar to a hop limit. Protocol. The protocol field indicates what protocol was used for the data put inside of this datagram. It really means the next higher layer in the stack, in this, this diagram. When we create the datagram, data comes from the, the application. Maybe we're using TCP as the transport protocol. That data from TCP is sent to IP, and IP creates a datagram. The data inside the datagram came from TCP. So the protocol field in the IP header says that this data came from TCP. There's a specific number that indicates TCP, I think the number 6. If it came from another protocol, like UDP, it gets a different number in the protocol field. So really the protocol field tells us where did, which higher layer did this data come from. TCP, UDP, there are others. In fact, ICMP is also a case there. I think it has a protocol number one. So it tells us the data inside our datagram, where did it come from? Header checksum is used when we receive a datagram to check if there are any errors in the header. A checksum is some error detection uh, code. We haven't covered the algorithms, but the concept is that Using this value, when we receive the header, we can check if the values in the header have any errors from what was transmitted. So we transmit some value of the protocol field, 6. The receiver receives the datagram and there was some error in transmission such that it comes out as 23. Using the checksum, we can detect that that was different from what was transmitted. So we can detect errors in the header. It doesn't cover the data. We don't know if there's any errors in the data, just the header. But IP has no retransmission scheme, so if I detect a, an error, all I can do is discard that packet. I cannot get the source to send it again. The last two fields are the address of the computer that generated the IP datagram and the address of the computer that 
is the final destination, the intended destination of that datagram. They are IP addresses. How long is an IP version 4 address? An IPv4, an IP address. How long is it? And the answer is on the screen. How long is an IP address? For example, how long is the source address? What's the, the picture tell you? How many bytes or how many bits? 32. All right. This diagram shows us the structure that... Okay, this is the header. These are the first 32 bits the next 32 bits and so on and okay we see that the source address the source IP address takes up 32 bits in the header so it tells us an IP address is 32 bits in length so a source IP address is a 32 bit value that identifies the computer that sends this datagram and the destination is a 32 bit value that identifies who we want to get it to the destination IP version 4 uses 32-bit addresses. IP version 6 uses longer addresses. Anyone know the value? I'm not sure if the slides say it anywhere. IP version 6. With IP version 4, with 32 bits, there are about 4 billion possible values. 2 to the power of 32 is around, is around 4 billion. So with a 32-bit address space, in theory, we can have, have up to about 4 billion different IP addresses. How many people in the world? Anyone? Roughly? How many people in the world? About 7 billion? How many people use the internet? Definitely not all of them. Uh, I don't know, 1 or 2 billion maybe? 1 billion? But now think about all the other devices. We don't necessarily, well, we need often IP addresses not just for your laptop, your mobile phone, your home PC, but many devices which connect to the internet, servers, uh, monitoring stations. So inside factories they use IP addresses. So if we think of the world and all the devices that want to connect to the internet, with a 32-bit address, we don't have enough addresses available to give a unique one to everyone okay. and there are ways around that and one of the main reasons that led to the development of IP version 6 was to give it a larger address and IP version 6 uses 128 bits with 128 bits we have 2 to the power of 128 possible addresses and I can't never remember the value it's something like billions and billions and billions of addresses for every person in the world okay so more than enough addresses if we use 128 bits ip version 4 32 bit addresses are used today but uh, we need special ways to overcome the the, the uh, limited number of addresses Before we look at how IP works, let's give an example of an IP address. Let's look at the configuration of my wireless LAN interface on my laptop. How many interfaces on my laptop? Anyone remember? How many network interfaces? Two? Three? Three, maybe if I turn them on. Wireless LAN, wired LAN or Ethernet, and Bluetooth can be thought of as an interface as well. This is the configuration of my wireless LAN interface. My wireless LAN card. It has a hardware address. That's used just on the wireless LAN. Just on that one subnet I use this hardware address to communicate with anyone else on the wireless LAN. Like the access point up there has a hardware address and it has an, an internet address 
which is our IP version 4 address. 10.10.100.184. There are some other addresses which are also special case IP addresses. Uh, it also has an IP version 6 address, an INET 6 address. This long string of hexadecimal values. Those three addresses, the hardware address, the IP version 4 and the IP version 6 addresses, are presented by my computer or by this software in some human-friendly form. Those three addresses are all just binary values. The hardware address is a 48-bit value, IP version 4, 32-bit, IPv6 is a 128-bit value. And my computer always deals with the, the binary value when I send the, the packets. It's just that so us humans don't have to write down these long binary values and we don't have to deal with them, there's some common way to convert them into some a little bit more human-friendly values. Let's look at how to convert IPv version 4 addresses. 10.10.100.184 How do we convert that into a the actual 32-bit binary address. Well, it's quite simple. And just, just note, this is a bad example from the perspective that this is, these are four decimal values. It's 10, 10, 100. Although it's ones and zeros, this is not binary. Okay? And this is 184. The way to convert it to that, the real IP address is that this is called dotted decimal notation where we have four decimal values separated by dots, and each of those decimal values represents 8 bits of the 32-bit address. So our IP address is 32 bits long. We break it into four chunks, each of 8 bits in length, and each of those 8-bit values are converted to a decimal value. And with an 8-bit value, the decimal values can range from 0 up to 255. So to convert to the binary, we just convert each of those four decimal numbers into an 8-bit value. And you can do that. We'll do it quickly. Uh, so 10... What have we got? That's 10 as an 8-bit value. And in fact, the next one is convenient because it's the same value. Ten, ten, one hundred. And, you, and you're checking that my conversion to binary are correct. 184, uh, it should go on the same line, but I'm out of space, but 184 is... So just convert the decimal values into 8-bit values. Remove the dots, and we now have a 32-bit IP address. So that's the simple way to, con or that is the way to convert from what's called dotted decimal notation to the actual binary value. And to go the other way, you take the binary value, 
break it into four 8-bit values, convert to decimal, insert dots between those four values, and we get what's called a dot or decimal address. So everyone can convert IP addresses now. Whenever you see an IP address for your computer, you can easily convert it to the binary form. So when my computer sends an IP datagram, the source address would have these 32, bit, 32 bits in the header. Destination address would be another 32 bits for the destination computer. Any questions on the conversion? Easy? Remember it because we'll use it, we'll need it to when we look at other parts of IP addressing. There are some slides later on IP addressing, this is just one example. So always remember IP addresses, in fact most addresses are, are stored in binary. It's just the human-friendly forms are used by computers by when we describe them uh, to make them a bit easier to communicate. That lists those packet header, uh, yeah, the header fields. Let's look at what have we got remaining. A few slides on some of the features of, of IP. And this one I think we've said uh, as enough of what I need to say is that IP is connectionless. We don't set up a connection. An alternative is what's called connection-oriented, where we do set up a connection. Now, IP doesn't do that. Not setting up a connection makes things simple. Uh, it, it's very simple. Uh, it can be flexible, it can work with many different types of connections, and there's no overhead of setting up a connection. But setting up a connection can be uh, of, a, of benefit in that we inform the destination we're about to send data, and they can negotiate parameters for that data transfer to, to optimize the data transfer based upon uh, what they agree. IP is connectionless. In the internet, the devices that uh, which, let's say are attached to the internet, we distinguish between hosts and routers. Just, I don't have it on the picture here, but going back to our example, we have subnets, these clouds, connected together via routers and not drawn here, but imagine attached to the subnets are hosts. Think of your end user computers, servers and so on. They are the hosts. And both hosts and routers need to implement the internet protocol. So they all take part in IP. What's the difference between a host and a router? What do we mean by them? Hosts are the end user devices. They create the data that needs to be sent across the internet and they receive the data. So they are the sources and destinations of the data. A router, in most cases, just forwards the data through the network. So in the typical uh, scenario, a source host creates the data, sends to a router, which forwards to another router, to another router, which eventually sends to the destination host. So that's the typical uh, role of those devices. Hosts are sources and destination, routers forward the data. Some characteristics. So think of a host as a laptop, a mobile phone, a server, some sensor in a network. Hosts normally use only one interface at a time. We said my laptop has three interfaces, wireless LAN, wired LAN, and Bluetooth. So I have three interfaces, and I may have three IP addresses, one for each interface, Bluetooth is an exception, 
but I normally just use one at a time. If I'm using the wireless LAN, and then I plug a wired LAN cable into my laptop, most likely my operating system will switch to use the wired LAN. You can test it at home. Test and see, okay, you're using a wireless LAN, then plug in a LAN cable. See whether the, the operating system switches. Normally they'll automatically switch to use the LAN cable, because in most cases that's better. So in most cases, hosts use just one network interface at a time, even though we have many. Now it doesn't have to be the case. You can set up your host so that it can use two, two interfaces at the same time. Uh, it's possible, uh, uh, so sometimes the operating system will support that. So I could be downloading data via the wireless LAN and the wired LAN at the same time. It's not common, but it's possible. Routers almost always have two or more interfaces and use at the same time. Because a router connects two or more subnets together. A router connects subnets together. So normally with a router we have, say, a cable connecting to one subnet and another cable connecting to another subnet. And we can be sending and receiving data on both of those interfaces at the same time. So that's typical operation for a router. And we may have more than two. A key and, and the primary difference if we want to define hosts and routers, a host does not forward datagrams, a router does forward datagrams. If we need one thing to, dis, to differentiate between the two, it's the forwarding of datagrams. A host never forwards datagrams. So what that means, if, if my laptop is a host, if it receives an IP datagram, it looks at the destination address. If the destination address in the header matches my computer's address, 10 10 10 10 10 100 184, then that datagram is destined to me and it's reached the destination. But if I receive a datagram where the destination address does not match my IP address, then that's an error. I will discard that datagram. I will not send it on to someone else. I will not forward it to someone else because this is a host. A router, of course, does forward datagrams. That's its main role. What is my laptop, host or router? Hands up for host. Think carefully. Okay, easy one. My laptop, host or router? It's a host. But in fact, I can easily turn it into a router. Okay? It's normally a configuration of the software, of the operating system, as to whether it forwards datagrams or not. And it takes me one line to turn this host into a router. Even with a single interface, I can act as a router. It may not perform well, but I can receive and send as a router. So I have, I have a wired interface. I could plug a wired LAN in and use the, my wireless LAN interface. And I could have this laptop act as a router but I'd have to configure it to do so. And the way to do that is to tell it to forward datagrams. Most uh, consumer operating systems don't uh, forward datagrams by default. That hosts by default. A host, because it doesn't forward datagrams, is either a source or a destination. A router mainly forwards datagrams, but in special cases it can act as a source or a destination. That's, that's in cases where we want to set up the router, we want to manage the router. Some of you would have done it, we, you've got a home ADSL router. Normally that home ADSL router forwards datagrams. It receives from your computer and sends them on to the ISP. So it's acting as a router. But sometimes you can, the router will support you configuring it, changing some parameters. So you open up your web browser on your PC, you type in a special IP address for that router and change some configuration of the router. In that case, the router is actually acting as a destination and source of datagrams. So in the main cases, 
a router forwards, but it can be a source or destination. And again, we've said this before, we distinguish between routing and forwarding. How are we going with time? Let me just see what we need to cover. We will not cover that. Forwarding. See if we can cover this today. This shows the protocol stacks for an example network or a path through a network. So we have some source host now. So think of hosts as the end user devices and routers connecting subnets together. So I want to send data from the source to the destination host via some set of routers. I don't care what's inside the subnets, whether it's a wireless or wired technology, whether it's a wide area network or local area network, just some subnet. And underneath those devices is the protocol stacks. So this is implemented inside the source host. And this is inside router 1, router 2, and so on. And this link, think of this as the cable connecting source host to router 1. Maybe wired or wireless connection, some link. At the bottom two layers, source host and router 1 are on the same subnet. So they must use the same technology to communicate across that subnet, across that link. And that's related to the data link layer and the physical layer. Recall that these two bottom layers are about getting data across a link. Not across a network, but just across an individual link, or in this case, a, a, or not across an internet, but across a link, or in this case, our subnet. So for example, a wired LAN, where the data link layer would be the IEEE 802.3 Ethernet standard and similar for the, for the physical layer. So both source host and router must have interfaces that support the same technology there. Let's say technology A. I haven't given it a name. Technology A. They need to be the same so they can talk. Router 1 and Router 2 are on the same subnet and maybe we use a different technology, technology B. They need to support the data link layer and physical layer so they can communicate to each other across the subnet and similar across the other subnets. The technology amongst the subnets may be different. So for Router 1 to talk to Router 2, it may use a different technology for the source host to router 1. So that's why I labeled this is data link layer A and physical layer A and this is B. So they may be different. What's one thing we notice? The routers generally need to support or need to implement the data link layer and physical layer for each subnet they connect to. Uh, maybe technology A is our wired LAN Technology B is uh, using ADSL and some ATM wide area network. Okay, so a different technology here. So they may be different across the subnets. The internetworking protocol, in this case IP, is what joins them together. And we see the hosts and all of the routers implement IP. And that's what allows us to send data across these different subnet technologies. They all use IP, the Internet Protocol. So hosts and routers in the Internet must implement IP. And we will not cover it today, we'll get onto it tomorrow, but there's a way in which we forward the datagrams to the router which then forwards it onto the next router and then it to the destination. The, the highest two layers, the transport and application layer, are only needed on the hosts, on, on the source host and destination host. We see the routers don't care what applications are being used. If we go back to our packet switching or our switching, 
The switches in the network just have the role of getting data from source to destination. They don't care what the data is. They don't care whether we're using TCP as a transport protocol, HTTP for web browsing, or we're using some voice over IP, some voice uh, application which uses UDP as a transport protocol. From the router's perspective, it's all just IP datagrams. The data inside is, doesn't care. So the transport layer and application layers, we say the protocols in those layers are end-to-end end -end protocols. They operate between the endpoints only. The routers don't need to implement those protocols. So in summary, data link layer and physical layer are common across each subnet. So here's one technology, here's a potentially different one. IP is common across hosts and routers. Transport and application layers are common across the hosts that want to communicate. So what does IP do? It's very simple in the, because there's no error recovery, no retransmissions, there's only one type of packet, an IP datagram. There's no acknowledgements, there's no setting up of a connection. We just create an IP datagram, send it to the router, which sends to the next router, and so on, until it gets to the destination. If it doesn't get there because of an error somewhere along the way, then too bad. There's no concept of retransmitting. The details of how we forward it through those routers we'll cover tomorrow morning. So we'll cover IP routing and IP forwarding, not with a W, tomorrow morning.